let's start with the basics. How would you define an Irish film? Because there, there are many, many definitions out there. Yeah, it used to be easier to do. It used to be very straightforward because when I started writing about film, it was the money that counted. Whoever financed the film got to claim it as their own. And that was straightforward, but now it's really, really hard to define what an Irish film is. It was also easier in maybe the 70s when you got a spate of films like Pat Murphy's, for instance, Anne Devlin, which was financed in Ireland, shot in Ireland, with an Irish cast by an Irish director. So that was very straightforwardly an Irish film. No, I think an Irish film is what is agreed upon as an Irish film. But I would say, I've had this discussion with a few people, particularly filmmakers, who don't want to jettison the idea of there being an Irish cinema. Um, so I guess you're talking about films perhaps with an Irish setting, with Irish characters, not necessarily with an Irish director, I would say. Um, but also things like local detail and accent are really important. So I think that films with, say, British actors in lead roles begin to dilute the notion of an Irish film. So, therefore, is Angela's Ashes an Irish film? Mm -hmm. um, I think it was, if it was just made by Alan Parker, but it had <laughs> Irish leads in the main roles, I would have less problems with it. Well, how about Daniel D. Lewis, then? Oh, he's I Irish. Well. I don't know. He is. He's got an Irish passport. He lives in Ireland. He has uh, Irish children. And so I have no problem with okay. him being... The grandson of Michael Balkan? Yeah, well, <laughs> no, his wife is... The, his wife is the... His father was Irish, after all. Okay. Uh, Cecil D. Lewis? Yeah, he was Irish. Oh, okay. Yeah, British court lawyer. Right? Yes, indeed. But you know that that's the way we, you know that's the way we do it. It's reverse yeah. colonization. Okay. Well, there is also the art like reading Michael Bart McLuhan and some of these other ones. The idea that a film like Pachin, because it's in Irish mm. uh, and it's, it's set in the real Ireland, which is of course in the West, um, is the only type of real Irish cinema. That's the heart of Irish cinema. What's your take on that? Yeah, I've never quite agreed with them on that one. There's also been uh, people like Martin and um, Kevin Rocket as well. We're writing at a time when co-productions really began to, to be the only way that people could finance films. And so, realistically, most Irish filmmakers, particularly around that time that they were starting to write that, those essays, which was late 80s, early 90s, most Irish filmmakers at that point couldn't internally finance a film uh, fully. So they had to go to co-productions, they had to go to German TV stations, French TV stations. And so you get what then became known as the Euro Pudding, and there was always this idea that they had sold out. So in order to get your German financing, you had to have a German au pair in the film. Uh, <laughs> or to get you know, Swedish financing, three sequences had to be shot in Oslo. Well, that's Norway. Um, <laughs> but you know what I mean. So, but but I mean, my sense was that actually, I thought it was, that was just a little bit too easy of an argument. And in fact, I went to a lot of trouble at one stage to interview producers of the films and say, what difference did co-production funding have on your film? Um, and of course, there's an inevitable answer to that question, which is none, I made the film I wanted to make. Um, and I think you have to take that with a pinch of salt too. But certainly, they were endeavouring to make films. And, you know, Pat Murphy's film, Nora, is one of the ones that I discussed in quite a lot of detail with the people who'd made it. And they were still, they still felt that they had made a film, the film that they wanted to make. Um, and that the co-production funding was just something they had to do. So I don't think, th y you can't just look back at the golden age of Irish cinema, which many people do in the 70s and 80s, where you get the Pochines and the, the Maves and you know, those, those films, Pigs, uh, and say th that was the real Irish cinema, because then you just discount everything that's made since, and you can't do that. Yeah, um, uh, I'm also curious the idea that um, the fun... Because there is the argument that funding, they'll fund certain types of projects and not others. The, the, <coughs> we talked about the whimsical Irish, the British like yeah, whimsical, yeah. whimsical Irish, Waking Ned Divine, even the commitments. Yeah. Yeah, um, like it's sort of glamorous poverty. Is there no argument there that these are films that are Irish, but they're also something else at the same time? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that's true. I actually think that now we've in a better place than, than even those films were because the thing that's changed is digital cinema. So those films all had to be shot on 35 mil, and so they were expensive. That was that, that's just simply that. Now you can, with with digital, there is um, a film board project that if you can make your film for under 
under 100,000 euro, they will fully fund. So then you don't have to get co-production financing. And, and then you get, I mean, you get a lot of small Irish films that don't travel, that never are seen by an audience other than at a film festival overseas. And so you could, you could easily make the case for those being really pure Irish films because they're not even, they don't even have the ambition to be shown overseas. Or they'd love it if they crossed over, you get once, which crosses over. Mm -hmm. And that's everybody's ideal, but also, realistically, most films are not going to achieve the success at once. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of moved almost back into a situation where you can have films that are very, very identifiably Irish. Um, and it's not just about funding, it's about address. Is it also about audience? Because, <coughs> like, the, the paradox is, of course, these English finance sort of American from the Hollywood finance films about Ireland are often more popular than, <laughs> much more popular than, than, than the local produce. Yeah, no, I mean, it's one of the kind of sad truths that Irish audiences much, much prefer to see big screen treatments of Irish stories. And so The Wind That Shakes the Barley uh, is going to be much, much more popular than um, Adam and Paul uh, because The Wind That Shakes the Barley gives the big screen treatments, stars, narrative, even if when it's Ken Loach, the narrative is a bit kind of some strange gaps. Um, and so, yeah, Magdalene Sisters was a huge success in Ireland because it was made uh, in the kind of star model and the Hollywood melodrama model. Um, but, yeah, I mean, and then there are, you know, every industry you know, can be self-critical and there's a lot of cri criticism of contemporary Irish filmmaking, which is that they, in fact, are not well enough made to get an audience. Um, and that there, is, there are really big problems at, say, script level, where, where you don't have a script doctor. Um, you know, every Hollywood movie's been so doctored that by the time it actually gets, on, gets made, you know, that the first person who wrote the script is, can hardly recognise what's on the screen. <laughs> Which, of course, explains, to some sense, the low quality of Hollywood films. <laughs> it does, or the, or the kind of um, the similarity between Hollywood <laughs> films, you know, the kind of... The, but then you've got... You know, we've got a culture where the writer is paramount. We've got this tradition of Irish writers. So, so anybody who's an Irish writer, even if they're the writer of a film script, believes that they're a creative genius in their own right, and, and you don't touch their scripts. So, this cre so there is a lot of argument, particularly around Irish scripts, that they're not you know, essentially good enough. Yeah, because yeah, I think the idea of like, small budgets are great, but actually larger budgets are not necessarily used for technical, they're often used for like script development. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's right. And then, I mean, you can even bring it right back to how is film being taught at film schools? You know, is there enough emphasis on the uh, team effort that goes into making a film? Or are you, are you always encouraging individualism? <laughs> so, yeah. 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 But just to get back to the idea of Irish film, because if it's what people agree are Irish, well, I think the film that always tops the list of the most popular Irish films is in fact The Quiet, the Quiet Man, Man. <laughs> <laughs> which, which is John Wayne. <laughs> um, your take on that? Yeah, you, well you can just never get away from it and people love it and people, you know, but people hate it in, in equally large numbers because it's offensive to them because it has every stereotype of Irishness that, that um, has ever been seen on the screen. Just, it's just a parade of Irish stereotypes. Um, no, it's not an Irish film. I would say absolutely not. It's a film about Ireland that has been hugely influential. Um, it's an Irish-American film, um, and that's, that's what makes it. Yeah. Although, again, Irish-American is sort of a subgenre because it's clearly distinct from mainstream Hollywood, and, it's, and it is concerned with Ireland in a way that, say, Le Miserable, a production of Le Miserable, is not really concerned with France. Yeah, and also, <coughs> but I mean, also it's a John Ford film, right. you know, and John, John Ford always made, uh, he has, he has a millions of Irish characters in his films, so this happens to be the, the, the Irish film. Um, you could say that How Green Was My Valley was his other Irish film. Um, but you could say The Grapes of Wrath was too. And you could say The Grapes of Wrath was, so, so you, you, can, you can't kind of take the auteur out of that film either. Yeah, I think that's right. What I like about that is actually I think it's the key to a lot of other films to understanding them, like in terms of images of immigration. I think so. Um, Rio Grande um, is with the same with Maureen O'Hara and um, and uh, John Wayne in it as well, where they've already got married. So mm -hmm. now they they're going to be remarried <laughs> in The Quiet Man. But that's a film that is all about to me about immigration mm -hmm. um, and about notions of home. Um, it really has. So much of that film is about the fact that um, yeah, her home was burned, 
uh, and so she has no home, so where's her home? Um, and with Maureen O'Hara, with her unmistakable Irish accent in the film, uh, you, you, you know, it has to be about about emigration. But it's also about Irish Americanness, because of course the Sons of the Pioneers stroll on the same thing, I'll take you home again, Kathleen. Yeah, which of course is a, is is a, is even a ballad that actually isn't even Irish. It's like it, when Irish Irish are smiling. It's, it's, it's yeah, Irish American, right? It's Irish American, but actually even even it isn't even Irish American because Kathleen is the only Irish content in, in that in that um, song. Right. So it was written to be a ballad that became assumed to be Irish because it had Kathleen in it, mm. but it's just a, it's just about immigrants. Yeah. Well, what I find interesting also is that like, your take on The Quiet Man is actually, as critical as it is, is actually much more favourable than many other writers. Well, well no, Luke, <laughs> Luke Gibbons really started the critical swing in favour of, mm -hmm. of The Quiet Man because what he said was, um, we shouldn't take it seriously. Right. We should understand that it's a film that, that recognises its own constructiveness. So it's a film that, particularly from certain sequences, and he starts with the sequence on the bridge where Sean Thornton stops on the bridge and looks over at the, the wee humble cottage. And uh, Luke says that in the backdrop to that sequence is so, is so patently fake that we're not meant to mistake it for the real island. We're meant to, mis we're meant to understand that it's the emigrant's dream. But I find that people are less embarrassed about it now. I think oh, no, no, now it's a text, yeah. And also because John Ford is so in as well, I think, yeah. you know. How could John Ford be a <laughs> No, Well, anyway, like, I, I, I'm interested in the idea that you have... Because a film like The Quiet Man, although he's, it's not, it's something distinct, uh, it's not Irish, it's not Hollywood, it's something distinct. And for some reason, um, there's a whole school of films like that. There's, and then there are a lot of Irish American films, and people around, and British as well, uh, that are fascinated with stories about Ireland. You don't see, there's, they're not, there are a lot of Germans in the United States, there are not a lot of stories about Germany. What is it about the diaspora? I think that. In part, it's because the Irish diaspora has been so so visible in American culture, and and the culture of, of the Irish diaspora, which is Irish music, images of Ireland, have been very acceptable as a way of standing in for the diaspora, the American population, the American emigrant population as a whole, so that you can understand you can understand emigrants in America through through Irish culture, if you like. And so that whereas there's a, there are problems with German culture. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they went to war. <laughs> they, there are enemies. Uh, there are problems with Italian culture. They're mafia. Um, well, unlike the Irish, ma uh, 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 Irish the criminals. Uh, Cagney uh, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, and Irish criminals have always managed to to be better integrated into the mainstream, or to be more romanticised. Right. I think that's it. Then, um, then. Well, I guess, you know, you have the Godfather, but even still, well, criminality is denoted very much as, as, you know, violent and unpleasant and not acceptable. Um, so, and it's only offset against the warmth of the Italian family. Whereas Irish violence, if you like, <coughs> if you like, has always been more um, presented as being kind of fun, and that brings us back to The Quiet Man and to the fight at the end of The Quiet Man, which is performative. And, and so violence brings everybody together at the end of the film. And, you know, it solves the problem. Right. Um, so, again, if you bring it back to America, Cagney, um, although he's a psychopath, maybe in white heat, uh, right. he's still the guy that everybody loves right. in, in American cinema. So, so you don't have that kind of estranging of Irish culture within American cinema that you, that you do automatically of German culture and, and really of Italian culture. I also wonder if it's because the Irish were there right at the beginning, they have Sidney Alcott in the teens, and then, then ca the, the Cagney gangster films weren't violent because in the 1930s they didn't really have disgustingly violent films, so they, didn't, they, didn't, they couldn't go that far. Yeah, and they also had, of course, what they had was, even though they didn't have their own filmmakers in Hollywood, they did have... John Ford and Leo McCary. And they did. They had all those people, and um, Raoul Walsh, for instance, right. um, who was really important and kind of gets forgotten about as an mm -hmm. Irish-American filmmaker. And then they had these very, very vociferous uh, pressure groups. They had the Legion of Decency, they had the Ancient Daughter of Hibernians, who were sitting there watching the films that were coming out and saying to the Irish population, who were a huge commercial entity, don't go to that film because it portrays negative Im images of the Irish. And the Italians didn't have that. 
So, so that what the Irish had going for them was a real policing of, of, of how their identities were being portrayed in Hollywood, and Hollywood was very sensitive to that. And if you go through the correspondence around certain Irish films, Irish films with Irish characters, you can see the real anxiety of, of the producers. Um, can you give an example of that? Yeah, films like The Fighting 69th. <laughs> when they made that, they went to such lengths not to uh, alienate the Irish, and, and, and anybody who complained was listened to. Um, and then there are others, there's a, going back in time, there's a film called The Callahans and the Murphys, uh, which brought out the Legion of Decency and the Ancient Order of Hibernians and all those pressure groups in such huge numbers that, um, that they had to change it because the church said, we're going to boycott this film, and if the Irish didn't go to it, then that film wasn't going to show. Yeah, but there were films with that must have been, been seen as negative Irish stereotypes. The Coens and the Kellys go, go here and go there. Yeah, I don't think they bothered about those so much because they were comedies. Because yeah, yeah. comedies, of course. Comedies yeah. can do that. <laughs> <laughs> and and you usually have a reconciliation at the end of the right. comedy between the two ethnic groups, you know. Maybe the Irish are yes. That's right, and the Kelly daughter does get to marry the Cohen son, and because the two families realise that they've got so much in common that <laughs> it doesn't... Well, because they're both American immigrants. They're right? both American immigrants, yeah. They've yeah. been through the melting pot. Mm. No, um, do you think there's a... I find in Irish American films there's uh, there are certain themes that are, are there in Irish films, but not as important emigration, uh, and also the whole generational thing. A typical Irish film has going my way, the older, the older Irish, set in his ways, and then the American is apple pie surrogate son. Um, you have that in Ireland, but it's not. As, do you think it's at less? It's less central than it is for the Irish American. Oh, I think Irish immigrant cinema is totally different to Irish local Irish cinema because they just they don't have the same set of concerns. And I mean, you also got to you got to think of the real life situation where the Irish in Ireland laugh at American Irish American tourists, and 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 so there's a real imbalance in in notions of Irishness, whereas where Irish Americans see themselves as being Irish. But the Irish men do not see the Irish Americans as being Irish. Yeah, they're Yanks, right? They're Yanks, yeah, they're a joke. Uh, and there's so many films built around the joke, the joke American, uh, yeah. who's laughed at. So that what's, what happened is that the two cinemas went off in such different directions that it's just like two different national cinemas almost. Okay. And now we're going to circle back to the original question, the secret of grown Inish. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Which is clearly, um, well... Irish characters, Irish setting, all these other things set in the west of Ireland. Um, but the concerns are really Irish American, that is, is uh, emigration. Actually, the same thought as the quiet man almost, like healing the wound of emigration. Um, how does that fit into the whole uh, national cinema thing? Is it really just an American film or an Irish American film? It's also, I mean, a, okay, again, it's an Irish no film, it's a, it's a John Sayles okay. film. And, and I think that this film is such a blip that it doesn't stand for anything <laughs> because it was John Sayles. It was almost a gift to his partner. His partner had wanted to make this film. She had wanted. It's a Scottish film. It's a Scottish right. story. They'd wanted to set it in Scotland, but in the end, probably and I don't know, but quite likely for tax break purposes. Well, also, he says because he's half Irish. Okay. And he says, reading it, he said, "Well, this is this is an Irish story." Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Immigration. Celtic. Yeah. But it's not really an Irish Irish American story. That's right. Celtic and and and, and selkies and whatnot. Yeah. Um. So, I just don't think it. It's such a, it's such an individualistic film that I'm not certain that it actually sheds a lot of light on the general picture. And that's another thing that, you know, when you've got not many Irish films, relatively mm -hmm. speaking, each one begins to take on an importance that it probably many of them don't actually bear analysis. Like Ken Loach's The Wind That Shakes the Body. <clears throat> yeah, like the, the like the Wind That Shakes the Body, which doesn't really represent a trend. It just represents mm -hmm. a Ken Loach film. Yeah, because there's not really a, I've not really noticed that many Irish films that are advocate socialist revolution. <laughs> no, and I mean, in fact, once you look at that film closely, it it starts off saying you know, that there was a socialist solution, but it doesn't follow that narrative. Yeah, yeah that's probably because, of course, de Valera was supposed to lead the socialist revolution. And, well, really? <laughs> yeah, I had, to go on, I had to go on air and discuss that film um, with um, a finophile politician and, um, and others. And I said, I, I think this film, you know, could be read, because he was, you know, claiming it as the great Fianna Fáil film. And I said, couldn't it be read as a critique 
of the failure of the socialist project in Ireland. And I, I mean, basically, he didn't even respond to that. It was such a ludicrous... <laughs> <laughs> such a ludicrous... And then he went on to say, it's a great tourist film, everybody will want to come. Well, you know, well, that's an irony, that's probably exactly true. It's yes. probably the only Ken Loach film that would be described as a great tourist film. Yeah, the <laughs> people love the scenery in it. <laughs> Why not go to see an Irish film and see the scenery? And that's what people do. I mean, that's one of the, one of the byproducts of Irish cinema, is the scenery and, and the tourist industry. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, that you brought up an interesting point that there aren't that many Irish films, but actually, for a smallish country, like four million people, it is astonishing how many, how many Irish films are made and, and also have gotten worldwide release. I'm sure the Netherlands is incredibly jealous. Yeah, well, they, they should start speaking English. <laughs> <laughs> is that the only reason? Then? Um, I think it's also to do with the diaspora. I think there's, there's an open door for Irish culture. Um, and. And that goes right back to that bunch of Irish writers in the poster behind me. So that Ireland has always been associated with culture and cultural output. Um, and, and now it's movies. Um, but it's also books and it's music. So, you know, you've got U2, um, you've got, you know, John Danville, you've got um, Neil Jordan. And so, so there is an open door f for Irish film because th there's that sense that the Irish, you know, do good culture. Yeah, but for a certain type of Irish film, right? Like the the ones that receive international. Like looking at the supposed to be Brendan Meehan is almost a classic of playing the wild Irish guy and uh, almost a stage Irishman, but of the the clever kind, not the buffoon kind. Mm -hmm. And um, I sometimes get the sense that there, there's an audience for Irish films if they're waking the divine. If they remake Waking That Divine one way or the other, the runway. Yeah, <laughs> no, there is that. But then, you know, uh, The Crying Game isn't Waking yeah. That Divine. I know it's an older film. Um, and I think that actually it's just inexplicable why certain films take mm -hmm. and other films don't. Though, though once, you can kind of see once why once took because well, it's. Because you're a charismatic uh, music, music, musician and a new central role. <laughs> yeah, and there was also a market at that time, for the kind of Little Miss Sunshine kind of films, which have. Which and and um, you know a certain kind of indie trend, which is about, which is about making naive films, yeah. and this is a naive film, and I think that you know that's what that's what people like. So it's not about the scenery, about the, about the Irishry. It's about that kind of naivety that the film has. We've written quite a bit about the Irish diaspora and the Irish actors in Hollywood, and um, you sort of I'm not sure if you went into this, but there's an idea now that Irish characters, because they keep their accents now, yes, um, sometimes. Mm. Um, well, some of them can't do the, one, the ones that do are often cast in uh, repositories of soulfulness. Mm, Gabriel they, Byrne. Gabriel Byrne. <laughs> <laughs> well, but even even Colin Farrell sometimes, like yeah. when he keeps his uh, accent, like he's wild and crazy. But is but the idea that well, Jim Sheridan uses African Americans in this way. They they have magical powers, um, right. and they, they heal you. And then they're also more soulful and they're more in touch with the world. And in Hollywood, it's instead of having African Americans do that, yeah, they have Irishmen instead, because they're, they're white and black at the same time, right? That's right, you know, they're white and others. So, so yeah, and I think, I guess what you get is, like, there's two kind of, there's two kind of models for being Celtic. One is to be a fighter, and the other is to be sensitive. So if you have, like, kind of hard Celticism and soft Celticism. <laughs> <laughs> and, um... Uh, and, it, Gibbons quick. Yeah, that's right. So you can, I mean, you can be both. Like, you can have somebody who is, you know, both tough on the outside and soft on the inside. Um, but but I guess particularly since the end of the Troubles, where the kind of the Fighting Irish became less of a relevant stereotype, um, so then you get much more of the kind of soft Celticism, the the sensitive Irishman coming in, and so now you're right, particularly within Anglo-Saxon cultures, where you, where you're not considered it's considered to be you know a sissy to express emotion. Um, you can then haul in the Irish individual who is able to express emotion, and it's usually the Irish guy, yeah. um, uh, who is able to express a kind of male sensitivity that his um, equivalent within, equally within British culture, but also within um, American culture can't do. And I think also there was, there was a time where, I mean, Hollywood was producing a line of male actors, the Ben Afflecks, and people who were simply very wooden actors. They didn't have an emotional range. So conveniently for Colin Farrell, he could <laughs> express an emotional range that Ben Affleck could not. So 
so they came to be cast in those roles that, that required more emotional range. And then you get the kind of backstory. You get Colin Farrell and all his, you know, brawling and his lack of political correctness and, uh, you know, the, the circulation of dirty movies <laughs> <laughs> that he's participating in. And so, on. so it's kind of feeding on, off, on, off. And, and again, um, you know, In Treatment is a really key, key TV series uh, where Gabriel Byrne plays the sensitive listener uh, but also somebody who's personally slightly confused. Um, so they all they all do build up, whereas, you know, Richard Harris couldn't have played those roles. He, ca he came from the kind of tougher line of Celticism. But isn't there a problem with the Irish fighter image? Because he, we, when you start approaching the T word, which is, you know, you know terrorists. <laughs> it's like, you're... Cause you, a typical... They, it's not that the Hollywood did not make IRA films, especially after the, the ceasefires, but... It was always, you know, you always have two IRA, the, the moderate and the, the, so you have Brad Pitt. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that in, an Aaron, in an Aaron jumper. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Bad Harris, well, he must be Irish. But he's, uh, but he's, the, he's soulful, he's a soulful terrorist. Soulful, but he's not really a terrorist because the, 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 there are worst ones out there. Yeah, well, America is always very conflicted about how it, how it can view freedom fighters. I mean, its own history is one of republicanism through violence. Yeah. Um, yet, after it, it becomes independent, America th therefore cannot, after that, condemn violence. And you know, now since 9/11, evidently it's more aware of terrorists. Uh, so it's always been conflicted about the notion of the freedom fighter, because that's its history. But then it has to re repress its own history in order to be a democracy. Mm. So that's the, that's always condition. And then plus, you know, even in the 70s and 80s, they still had to be aware of the Irish American population. Uh, so they didn't want to offend anybody by having like that. So yeah, so and, but, and and that Irish American population too is, was probably more Republican than anybody else, right. uh, particularly in Ireland. Um, <laughs> so it had to kind of please them, but not but not be offensive. Yeah, because who is the audience for films about the IRA in, in the United States? Obviously, it's yeah, the Irish it's, it's the Ar were, yeah, it's yeah. the old Irish Americans who yeah. still you know gung ho about about the IRA. And so that's how, why you have Tommy Lee Jones as what the, someone who's too crazy for the IRA. That's right, he's blown away. He's, he's, a, he's the utterly crazed terrorist with an, with an atrocious accent. But then you have Richard Gere in The Jackal, right. who plays the kind of sensitive IRA <laughs> man who can put his terrorist years behind him and, and help save America. One thing about the Irish, I think you at least implied, well, the lot, you know, successful Irish actors are often the dark, Gabriel Byrne, and Colin Farrell. Um, because you make the point that, because uh, you mentioned that there are very few Irish women, like you did have oh. once. You did have the Maureen's. Maureen, the Maureen's and Maureen Harry, Maureen O'Sullivan. Um, but they had very, as you mentioned in one of your books, is like they're very white. Yeah. Like they're very pale. Yeah. And you don't have like, you don't have red hair pale actors who are making it either. It's like the Irish actors could be black and white at the same time, but the Irish actresses cannot. No, they can't be. They're too white. Um, they're too white because the fantasy of, of the. Um, the fantasy of, of female beauty is is kind of vaguely mixed race without stating it. Angelina Jolie. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And and so you, you can kind of look slightly Latina. I mean, it's okay to be a little bit Latina, but not too Latina. Um, so J Lo, you know, had had notorious issues with her figure because she, you know, her bum was too big basically <laughs> for Hollywood. Um, so, but but she still represents a type of beauty that that. Uh, you know, Irishness with its very clear notion of what beautiful is, very white skin, very red hair, uh, is just old fashioned, it doesn't fit. But, and then there's also, I mean, also so many more complex roles. I mean, men are not defined by beauty, uh, whereas women are still in Hollywood. Um, so men can occupy more complex roles. And then the other role that is also available for them is Liam, ne Liam Neeson's role, which is patriarchal. Right. Uh, he's a father in, in every film that he's been in recently. He's he's constructed as a, a kind of, you know, faulty father. <laughs> who, will, who will come and slowly kill your, your, your his daughter's kidnappers. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Only because he's a good, basically, you know, he's got Ar good Irish family values. <laughs> that's what we do. <laughs> I have to laugh because the Taken, I saw it, they used to show that trailer before every film for months. And <laughs> well, he makes very bad choices, but <laughs> he's just in terrible, terrible films. No. But he plays fathers. Yeah, yes. So yeah, I can see that. So that's, but that's that's sort of a new stereotype, though, isn't it? I don't really see that. Like unless you count the Barry Fitzgerald, but I think that's a very different sort of thing. Or even um, Albert Finney in um, the Coen Brothers film *Mother's Crossing*. Yeah. Gabriel Byrne plays the surrogate son. He plays the old 
traditional father, you don't really see that type of Liam Neeson type of patriarch in these films. Really. No, and I mean, maybe it's just possible because Liam Neeson's reached a certain age, and, and that generation of actors is all reaching it. Uh, Gabriel Byrne, Stephen Ray, who maybe doesn't have such a big profile in Hollywood, but still, you know, mm -hmm. a figure that you would recognise, um, Neeson and so on. Uh, you know, it's stretching it to have them as a romantic lead, even though <laughs> Hollywood can do it. Um, so there's a new role for those guys, which is as the sort of sensitive, sensitive patriarch. Getting back to yet another point, you mentioned that there are not that many Irish films. Um, the do you see? Uh, a, a growth coming in our, our Irish films, or just you know, we reached a sta stasis? No, I think it's growing. I mean, it's, it's been interesting in, in, you know, that we're in uh, a crisis of mm. unbelievable magnitude. Uh, yeah. You know, our economy crashed and it went down, and, and it hasn't even been fixed yet. I mean, we're told, we're sort of told, oh, you know, we, we're going to start improving soon. But that just means we've reached the bottom. It doesn't mean that things are better. It just means that there's possible that things aren't going to get any worse. Um, so we've got a totally crashed economy, um, whereas you know, in the Celtic Tiger years there was, there was buckets of money, so it was easy to support the Irish film industry via the Irish Film Board and other incentives, and you've got to remember that the Arts Council has always been uh, a reasonable supporter of Irish film too, the more Irish art film. So, but funnily enough, um, in the vast cuts that have taken place, actually film hasn't been proportionately as badly cut as have, say, you know, dance groups. How would you explain that? Is it because of economic spin-offs expected from it? Yeah, I think so, because it's got cultural value. It's got c cultural and commercial value. And in that sense, it's also been a very good advocate for itself, which is to play the fact. Um, I mean, the word culture industry is maybe not one that we, that <laughs> we would like to subscribe to, but it's a very good way of promoting film, because it, um, if they call themselves the culture industry, then they also begin to fit into the quote-unquote smart economy. Um, so people are cultural producers. And, and that's, that ticks boxes for governments. Mm -hmm. uh, they like um, something that is both cultural and an industry. Here's a paradox for you then. Because before the, the fall of the first Irish Film Board and the beginning of the second Irish Film, we had a period there where really there was no funding, government funding going on. And in that period you had, what, My Left Foot, in the, name, game. In the name of the Father, The Crying Game, um, The Commitments, uh, December Bride, um, uh, Hushabye Baby. Um, a lot of the films that are considered like among the best that ever come out of Ireland, and also many that found international audiences. Um, was it just on the momentum from the first film board, or is this like no. is there a, a no? There's a really model? Good, there's a really good reason for this. It's because British television was flourishing at that point, mm. and all those films were funded by British television. And um, that's a period of, of huge growth for British cinema as well, which is under Thatcherism. Um, and you get some of the best, best British films being made uh, because of really, really enlightened policies uh, in, in British TV. And that includes people like UTV that you wouldn't expect, or ITV that you wouldn't expect to be funding um, uh, interesting films. So, so those you know, clever Irish producers realised that they were going to get money from British television. And that's... And that's where, and you, I think in, in large part, it was at that point the rise of Channel 4, which then was a cutting-edge uh, British um, uh, television channel. Now it's just full of trash. But, but then it had a remit to address uh, audiences that hadn't been catered for. And in fact, it's through them that you got the financing for, essentially, for Hush by Baby, because they financed the workshops that produced a certain amount of regional films. And Hush by Baby was one of those. But getting back to the idea of the Irish diaspora and, and, there's, and the cinema that's associated with it, do you see any any common threads between that and other types of diasporic cinema? Yeah, I think that, for instance, there are certain themes. So you get the generational conflict that arises between maybe the first generation immigrant and their children. And that's something that you get in Irish American cinema, you, you get it in Italian American cinema, Greek my big fat Greek wedding, and you know, all those those films that we've learned to love, and and you know films about Asian communities very much that conflict, and I think you can also look at questions of space, um, how do you know space works through in terms of social mobility, so the movement from the inner city ethnic community to the suburbs is something that is common to a lot of ethnic grouping fil films about ethnic groups, say in Hollywood, and then you've got generic formula and you've got people then who can use 
recognisable signifiers of ethnicity, like Martin Scorsese, and swap between ethnic groups. So you can move from mean streets to the departed without a major lurch. <laughs> <laughs> or you could take the departed and put Italian character. It's called it an Italian instead of Irish, and notice no difference whatsoever. Oh, that's true. <laughs> Uh, except it wouldn't work so well in South, Bo in South Boston. So right. it's Although there are lots of Italians in Boston as well. Yeah, but the narrative, <laughs> the narrative is about the Irish. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, one wonders why. And also the, the, the gangs of New York, which was um, the most bizarre uh, take on, on, on the Irish experience that I've ever seen. It was different. Um, it was, I, I, mean, I kind of like that take, which is that the Irish experience is born out of um, intolerance and violence. Um, and it's 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 a much more interesting take than than the kind of oh the Irish were just sort of always automatically good emigrants, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I kind of like that. And then of course Daniel Day Lewis steals the show and topples the meaning of the film over yeah. totally. Well, yes, I, Daniel Day Lewis is what, the saving grace of this 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 kind of weak romance between DiCaprio and uh, oh yeah and and, Di a, and the generic Hollywood. Check whose name I can't remember. Oh, which which one was it? Yeah, you know, rent a blonde. Yeah, yeah, yeah um, stick figure. It was like, Cameron Diaz, I think. Uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, and I mean, also, it's always been baffling to me as to why uh, Leonardo DiCaprio became uh, Martin Sc Scorsese's leading guy because he's just, you know, he's not interesting enough. Uh, whereas Daniel Day Lewis is, he's got all that strength of character that De Niro had. Uh, yeah. So, so that's why he steals the show. Yeah. Yeah, just a better actor. Better actor, more interesting, <laughs> yeah, more, more compelling. Yeah, I'm, 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 your question of space is interesting because I think a lot of films, you can always tell, because there are two, I would say there's two different types of the uh, the immigrant film, that is, there are ones that depict home space as constricting, you know, and so on, and then some of the, the, and then the outer America usually has this wide open, wonderful, but there's also ones that show the home space is quite supportive and nurturing, and the outside is quite nasty and uh, do you see both streets of that in Ireland or do you see one uh, an Irish American diaspora film or do you see just one more prevalent? You got I mean you've got a kind of strange thing which is you start with the gangster films which are probably the ones that people know best because of Cagney and and so in the Cagney films you usually have the Irish mother who is um, well in the kind of earlier films she's uh, a positive representation and then you know, she becomes crazed and demonic by the time you get to White Heat and she's the problem in White Heat. Um, so you've got, you know, the, the domestic space is, is regulated by the Irish mother and then where she, when she loses control on the streets then it becomes anarchic. And, and then what happens is that when Irish cinema began to use genre films, um, which was really, uh, I guess, pretty much the 90s, uh, and films like The General, even though, you know, John Bourne's film is, again, you know, is an Irish <laughs> film. <coughs> but, uh, you know, let's say uh, it is. Um, you then get a, but you get a whole run of Irish gangster films that import back the Irish gangster from the States into into Dublin. And, and by that stage, Dublin had moved uh, architecturally into being a more recognisable global city. So you could more convincingly set gangster films in Dublin and get them to look like Los Angeles, whatever, <laughs> so that it was a recognisable space that couldn't have been used before because Dublin just hadn't evolved enough to make those kind of films. So there is, that's where perhaps the two, um, the two cultures speak to each other in that, in that way. Yeah, that's an interesting thing about the gangster film because, of course, there's a tradition of gangster films within Irish cinema already, which is the Troubles film, mm -hmm. which are all, from Odd Man Out on are always... You know, film noirish, angel, crying game, whatever. Yeah, um, is a. Do you think the idea of space also works in there about home space and because the crying game is like an immigrant film, isn't it? Yeah, uh, but the crying game, of course, is also about the Irish in, in Britain right. more, and that's the that's the kind of invisible diaspora. So this, you know, you can't compare the experience of the Irish in America on screen with the experience of the Irish in Britain on screen because you can't compare the response of those two cultures to Irish immigrants. So what happens in, in, in British cinema is the Irish immigrant uh, becomes really very secondary to the narrative. So you don't have narratives that hinge on the identity of the Irish immigrant. Well, so, well how about the crime game where <coughs> he, he goes there, the immigrants do, and he as it creates a new identity for himself. 
but he's can't escape it. Yeah, that's right. No, that, no, that's right. And it's also an IRA identity. Right. And he, he can't escape the IRA identity there because it comes back and it holds him. But then, see, there's a difference, which is that The Crying Game is an Irish film. And so it's, an entire, it's a film framed entirely by an Irish understanding of Irish identity. Whereas the Cagney films, for instance, are essentially American films, which are reframing Irish identity and putting that in the American space. Because for Irish Americans, immigration was a good thing, it wasn't a tragedy. No, that's right. Except uh, for The Quiet Man. Which is <laughs> no, that was therapeutic. Um, yeah, and, and then also because in America the Irish were the uh, immaculate emigrants, they were the emigrants who, who best exemplified what happened when you left your home culture, you came to America and you did well and you could become president. Yeah. Um, once. once. <laughs> <laughs> and then guess what you could do. Uh, s whereas in Britain, the Irish were always the, uh, you know, n well, Britain just never had that policy of welcoming emigrants yeah. or considering that emigrants could be a constructive force. Um, so, and then because of the closeness of the troubles to British politics, the Irish always had to be hidden away in some way or demonised as, 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 as kind of reverse invaders. Or Comic, become comic character. Um, mm. Mother was it? Old Mother Riley. Old Mother Riley. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, and of course played by a British actor. Too. What pissed me also about the sport cinema is that um, because of more and more populations moving now, globalization and all that, all the other thing, it's more and more. What you see more and more of these types of films, and not just the older groups, uh, Chinese, Pakistanis, and so because of this, do you think there will be more? of those type of Irish films, or, they, or is that a, a generational thing that's going to fade? Well, you see, there's also a huge difference, because the um, Irish diasporic films in Hollywood are being made by Hollywood, right. whereas the new emigrant films are being made by the new emigrants, right. and they're being shown in festivals and, and art, art cinemas, and they're not made for entertainment purposes, they're mostly made qu quite seriously to discuss issues. I wonder if there's a future for these type of films beyond the festival circuit, and Maybe because of the Irish success of some Irish diasporic films, um, maybe there, there is sort of an equivalence there. Yeah, I think there probably is. I mean, again, I think that they, they have to conform still to the expectations of the cinema-going audience. Right. And, um, and some do, but then, you know, then it is still that question of, are you performing a stereotype in order to uh, make your way into the mainstream? Because you can argue that about Once. Once right. is a film that does trade in Irish stereotypes to a certain extent. Absolutely. Well, that's true. Does it matter who the maker, when using a stereotype, does it matter who the purveyor of the stereotype is? No, no, it doesn't. Only Irishmen can tell how your stereotypes No, 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 it doesn't. It just, it's just, I mean, it's very hard to make films that don't have stereotypes. Let's be, yeah. re, let's be realistic. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you can call them archetypes, then. <laughs> <laughs> and just because a film's low budget doesn't make it, you know, always cutting edge. It just sometimes can just make it bad. Yeah. Uh, so, but yeah, no, I, I think there, there is, um, it's difficult because there's, on the one hand, there's a huge kind of um, space there for emigrant cinema of all kinds, you yeah. know, Lebanese, whatever you like, but that, that is still not really uh, consumed by the mainstream. So it has to be through a larger industry. Yeah, and a circuit of consumption that is, um, well, it's, you know, it's the, it's the internet, but even still, for most people, they want their film to show in a cinema, realistically. And so, so films that you know we as as kind of film <laughs> studies people okay. are watching and thinking are, are critical. Uh, we can easily forget that they're not being watched by most people who go to yeah. cinema. The, so much of the the writing about cinephilia these days is about like the cine, the um, uh, the magic moment, the cinephilic moment, where you have the scratches on the celluloid, the the pleasures of cinema that are not incidental to the actual narrative. Do you? Are, do you agree with that sort of uh, discourse? And um, if you do, what, could you talk about your cinephilic moment? If you have yeah, one. No, indeed. Well, I think that in this kind of cinephilia is a, is, a, is a blanket term for a lot of different experiences. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and, you know, as you say, we're in a moment of huge nostalgia for the notion of going to the movies because right. people are watching them in their iPods and that, you know, those of us who don't watch movies in their iPods despise people who do. Um, <laughs> and yes, I mean, for me, it's still magic to go to the movies and I would probably watch anything in the cinema. Uh, and I have a much better tolerance watching in the cinema of something than I would on TV because I'd just change channel if it was on TV and I wasn't liking it. And so we've got um, 
we've got our generation's uh, somewhat you know disdainful approach to those who are not going to the cinema uh, and we've got a kind of sense of nostalgia for 35 mil because now most of what we're seeing is digital and with all the best will in the world it, it's not the same experience so and so so that brings out a certain elitism already inherent uh, and and a kind of group of a group identification among cinephiles but again i don't think that i th I don't think that it. I don't think I didn't totally include myself in that group. In that, what always worries me about cinephilia and makes me feel anxious with a group of cinephiles is the the level of knowledge that a lot of people have that I don't have. <laughs> and um, I always dread giving a talk to an evening class, for instance, where you're bound to have three or four people who just know so much more about the film that I'm talking about than I do. And the first question, the first time the hand goes up, and the person says. I'm surprised you didn't mention <laughs> something. Or, really, didn't you know that Nick Rogue was second AD on Lawrence of Arabia? Then I, then I just think, oh, here we go. Because I don't know stuff in the same way that they know stuff. Does cinephilia <clears throat> always require that sort of knowledge of cinema? Because isn't it possible to enjoy, enjoy the, the pleasures of cinema in a cinephilic way without having seen 17,000 films? Yeah, of course it should be, but I think you come up again that the conversation then comes back after the movie to how I can locate this film within a rainbow of other films that I've seen and know about. And and for me, there's, and I'm afraid to say it's gendered because it, this is a guy thing. It's like football statistics, um, cricket results, or you know whatever you're into, bands. Um, and just knowing stuff about the thing makes, you know, in my opinion, guys feel a little bit more secure about their place <laughs> in the world. So they bolster up their, their who they are by just knowing a lot of stuff. And, and they accumulate more and more and more and more knowledge. Uh, and then I feel excluded because I just, mm. or I forget, or I get it wrong. Or <laughs> I look at me and think, oh, really? You're not one of the club. Mm. So I, that always alarms me. And then there's also fandom, and you've got to take fandom into account too, mm. because, because although, you know, the cinephiles probably. Uh, are dismissive of the fans. In fact, they are fans, right. and they're you know the ultimate fan. Uh, and 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 I mean, I had this experience when I read uh, a book on Hedy Lamarr. I read a, a, basically a film star biography of, of Hedy Lamarr, but I wrote it for an academic press, and I wrote it as an academic. And so then I made the mistake. Uh, well, I kind of couldn't stop myself looking at you know some of the sort of discussion boards, and you get all these fans saying. Well, she didn't love Hedy, and, um, and she's just not. She doesn't seem. She's been critical about Hedy in in the book, and they sort of feel, oh, you know, they want a book that's just a love affair with 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 the film star. With lots of pictures. And lots and lots of pictures, <laughs> and some you know kind of titillating facts, but nothing that, nothing that you know causes a ripple in the image. Isn't there more? Isn't there more pleasures available in cinema, than just, you know, the uh, the fetishism of little things, and they. If you say, well, it's not the celluloid of the 35, it's like the experience of being in the dark and so on. Um, doesn't that give you kind of an information about how films are enjoyed? Yeah, but you see, not now. Because, yeah. I and mean, I had this discussion with my students, because we were holding screenings. In, at Trinity, we don't have the same system as you do. So at Trinity, the students have screenings in the evening. Mm -hmm. uh, they expect to attend them, or they were. And then, um, you know, we have a discussion class the next day or during the week at some stage. And it came to my attention that screenings were being poorly attended, so we had a meeting with the class reps, and I said, you know, I can't believe you, we've got, you know, we've got this room, it's in the dark, you're getting the experience of going to the movies. And they said, that's not our experience of going mm. to the movies, and it's not, because when they go to the movies, they take phone calls, they chat to each other, and they're distracted. It's not like, it's, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not Benjamin any longer. What is really great for this generation is, in fact, they're much more cine-literate. Than we were everything's available. Because everything's available and they're torrenting and they're you know, they're doing whatever and we mightn't approve of it and we mightn't approve the way they're seeing the films and it's not probably the correct aspect ratio. Um, but they are they have a knowledge of film that is really rewarding. Um, mm. particularly those who are gonna go back in time. And there are certain sort of, you know, film directors that they all do fasten on to, <laughs> to watch. So, you know, everybody's seen Clockwork Orange. Okay. Um, but and, but and they do. And Scorsese as well. And Scorsese, Scorsese <laughs> Clockwork Orange, and apparently not David Lean. Um, so, so I think that's admirable. And I think the access that they have to the back catalogue of films is, is incredible. And I also, then, then I then revisit people like Robin Wood, 
who were writing in the early days where they had to write from memory of having right. seen the film and they couldn't see it again. You think, wow, that's incredible. Or, or James Agee writing uh, this, this long article in the silent films that he hadn't seen in 30 years. Yeah, no, that's, that's brilliant, <laughs> you know. And, and, and so, oh, you know, you have to admire those guys a lot. Yeah. But it's just change. I think the notion of cinephilia is, it's like all things, it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's dynamic. Well, yeah, but I think that the look at what gives you pleasure in cinema is actually very interesting. Oh yeah, I mean the the voyeuristic pleasure. Of yeah, so, in the and dark. I, you have to be at the same wa wavelength. But if you are on the same wavelength, you say, "Well, this is very interesting." Uh, at least I find it interesting. I mean, yeah, it know, is, I and, and I mean also when people laugh at, in in you know when collectively people laugh at a moment yeah. in the film, particularly when it's not the moment that the filmmaker expected them Absolutely. to laugh, it's a really really interesting experience. Yeah, I, I agree with that. So, let's put you on the spot. Are you willing to talk about your initial cinephilic moment? Do you have one? No, I don't have one. Um, no. You know, it, it wasn't the moment that I went to see um, The Sound of Music in a small <laughs> cinema in the west of Ireland because uh, that didn't, <laughs> that didn't uh, funnily enough, transform me into a cinephil. It was a, it was, I'll tell you what it was, it was a very gradual process of yeah. going to work in the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London where I got a job. Mm -hmm. um, by chance, I wrote to them and said, I wonder if you have any work because I'd really like to go and work with you. And somebody from the film department was going on maternity leave and I got her job because I didn't have to advertise it and then she didn't come back and I stayed. And at that point I realised that I knew nothing. Um, and at, at that point too I was attending, by pure chance, a course at the British Film Institute. Uh, they're very, very famous night courses which introduced many British academics to film studies. And so it was, that, it was actually that gradual process of sitting every day watching movies and realising that this was just incredible. And I'd come from a literary background and I hadn't really ever thought about film in that manner and 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 yeah there's something magic about the movies for me now and and it is in part sitting in the dark watching them. Oh, so the, the, the collective experience the dark size of the screen? The uh, collective experience size of the screen but also I think it was that non-mainstream quality ah. it was the fact that I was in an outhouse right. uh, cinema uh, watching outhouse films so for me, it was the it was exploring the pleasures of non -ma non mainstream cinema that oh. really set me on my on my path. Cultural cachet involved. And so there's always been a history of film clubs as well. Yeah, I think so, and it, and and it's the environment that you're in. So yeah. I was working in it, discussing it. We had you know Derek German was in and out. We had all kinds of filmmakers in and out talking about their work, and so it it wasn't just the isolation, it wasn't just the finished product on the screen, but it was the process of it. Mm -hmm. That was that really got me. Yeah. I like the behind the scenes stuff. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not a DVD extras watcher, but I do kind of like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not either. Um, so here, so considering that you got through it as film as cultural cachet, how did Brief Encounter end up as your number one film? I just love that film mm -hmm. so much, and it's 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 again to do with a lot of things. It's partly to do with its delicacy of touch, mm -hmm. the fact that it's elusive it doesn't mm. um, it doesn't have to spell out what it's doing um, it's those crisp British performances that I do <laughs> enjoy <laughs> you know it's a good a good post-colonial subject I'm drawn to them um, and it's I like the fact it's quite a short film mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't overextend itself and it's now that you can watch thanks to Criterion you can watch it in it's really as close to its perfection um, it's just a beautiful film to watch, and those trains coming in out of mm -hmm. the station kind of whoosh, but it's fabulous to look at. Yeah, so yeah, I think it's a model, mm -hmm. to me, of what film can do. And also the idea that the best romances are ones where they don't get together in the end. No, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, of so like uh, Les Enfants de Paris, all these films. That's yeah. right, it just leaves you wanting more at the end. Um, yeah. Also the idea that, although it was set before the war, it was made right after the war, the, the idea that true love doesn't you don't live ever happily ever after is probably much more resonant then too. And, and I think in that film too there's a really, it, wh what it does is it, it accepts her, her bourgeois husband right. and it doesn't say, it doesn't turn him into the kind of stereotype it could have turned him into. He's a decent guy who's just not very exciting. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, okay. Well, sensitive it turns out. He turns out and of course you know many people have problems with the uh, perhaps more stereotyping of the working class characters in that which is exactly of its moment. Right. Um, so yeah, no, it's really interesting. I like. I would always try to contextualize films within their cultural moment, and it just gives you an insight into the cultural moment as well. Well, thanks very much. No, thank you. Yes, I enjoyed that. I hope you didn't mind. No, no, look, I'm really. Easy.
Det är inte så jag har trott. Det är inte så jag har trott. Det är inte så jag har trott.